a very good evening and supi ho to to one and all welcome to the buddhist mahavira's uh, facebook page we are going live this evening um a bit early because normally we run at 8 30 but this evening we have to, to start the show uh, this dhamma sharing at 7 p.m because our speaker is based in australia and there's a time difference a three hour time difference so to accommodate our speaker we had to start this evening's dhamma sharing at seven uh, i also noticed that well this could be lunch uh, sorry dinner time for many of us uh, but all the same well, we still would like to carry on with the dhamma dana series and we're very happy that we have this new speaker with us this evening she's actually a, a nun a bikuni uh, but she's based in australia and let me invite uh, our speaker this evening her name is aya suvira good evening uh, bikuni or aya suvira Suvira, how are you? I'm very well. Yourself? Um, we are good. We are good. Um, just that I'm a bit weary because the numbers don't seem to be picking up because it's still early for us here in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, but all the same, we will carry on with this evening's Dhamma sharing. Uh, for our audience um, knowledge, let me quickly read uh, Aya Suvira's um, profile. Now, Aya Suvira is a Buddhist nun or bhikkhuni in the Theravada tradition and also is a student of Bhante Sujato. Uh, she received her seminary ordination in 2016 and higher ordination as a bhikkhuni uh, at the Dhammasara Nuns Monastery in 2019 with Aya San, uh, Santini of Indonesia as preceptor and Ajahn Brahmanso as instructing teacher. At present, she works at Sutta Central uh, related projects dealing with Sutta perils in Sanskrit. With the support of Bhante Sujato and Sister Tina Ng, and the team at the Metta Center or Metta Rama Working Group, she's continuing the vision of Metta Rama's projects to provide uh, an urban residence for nuns in Sydney. Uh, Aya Suvira is fluent in English and Mandarin. Now, Aya Suvira will also be speaking to us in Mandarin next month. Uh, at, I think it's the early part of February. And But this evening, Aya Suvira will be talking on pure bliss the theory and practice of joy in Buddhism based on the suttas. We now like to invite um, Aya Suvira to start this evening Dhamma sharing. Thanks so much, Tilak. It's really um, a pleasure to be here this evening. The Buddhist Mahavihara is obviously a very established organization that's been doing um, a lot of work for Buddhism in Malaysia and internationally. So it's, um, yeah, really, um, it was a joy for me to be able to accept the invitation. So before we begin this evening's talk, I'd like to begin by saying Namatasa and paying respect to our original teacher, the Lord Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. And to ease into the talk this evening, I thought it would be nice to spend a few minutes, um, you know, briefly just sitting quietly and doing a little bit of metta meditation because metta is obviously a joyful state you can't have a metta without having joy at the same time so what i'd like to invite um, the participants to do is to make yourselves comfortable at the computer um, if you're at home just by sitting up in a nice upright comfortable posture and gently closing your eyes and bringing your attention to the words of metta so breathing in may i be well May I be happy. May 
may I be at peace. And breathing out. May I be well. May I be happy. May I be at peace. And we can just spend the next minute spreading the warm, gentle feeling of metta to ourselves. Making the feeling of metta fill our whole bodies from the top of the head to the soles of our feet. Just feeling the feeling of friendship and acceptance with ourselves. And now we've cultivated met the for ourselves, we can spend a minute to spread metta to others. So wishing, may others be well, may others be happy. May others be at peace. To all of our friends, our relatives, people maybe we don't know so well. To all of the people around us in our lives. May they be well. May they be happy. May they be at peace. And we can extend that feeling, that wish for well-being to the whole world, to whatever living beings there may be. So we can wish, may the whole world be well, may the whole world be happy, may the whole world be at peace. We can gently bring our attention back to the room and slowly and gently open our eyes and proceed with this evening's talk. I, I was very happy this evening because I got a free choice of the topic. So this is actually something from my own inspiration which is quite nice because, um, you know, everything this evening is uh, things that are personally quite meaningful to me. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to get the screen sharing to work. Share screen. So share window. Aha. And I'm going to navigate. So you should all be able to see the PDF. So if everything's worked correctly, you should be able to see um, the PDF that's going with this evening's talk. So the title for this evening is Pure Bliss, The Theory and Practice of Joy in Buddhism. And today we'll be looking at some sources from the Sutta Pitaka. So in the three baskets of the Pali Canon, the Sutta Pitaka is the basket of discourses. So the Buddha's teachings known as suttas. So I just wanted to share some images, first of all, because um, in Sydney at the moment, we're quite lucky to have um, an exhibition on at the moment, which is focusing on these um, amazing statues of arhats that have come from Korea. And, you know, there's lots of statues in that, of arhats in the world. What's so amazing about these ones is that their faces have actually been sculpted to show, um, you know, realistic human emotion. So, um, you know, we have these stone statues and some of them are wrapped in, you know, their robes, meditating happily, and they're smiling, which is very nice because, you know, sometimes when people get this image of arhats, which is, you know, arhat is the Sanskrit term for what we call an arahant in Pali, meaning a worthy one, so an awakened being. Um, sometimes when we think about what an arahant actually is, um, we might not necessarily have this kind of fully fleshed out emotional picture. So I like these statues because they, they show that awakening is, is something that happens, you know, in the human world that happens in this embodied context um, you know, of our lived experience and of our emotions. So we have this um, beautiful gentleman on the left who's, you know, just meditating happily. And on the right, we have another very happy gentleman um, who's holding a wish-fulfilling jewel, um, you know, which is called Chintamani in, in Sanskrit. So to me, this really, it spoke to me, and that's why I, I wanted to share it because there's a Burmese saying that Buddhism is like, um, it's like a mountain of jewels and that, um, you know, that faith, that sadha is like the hand that makes it possible for us to reach out and take the jewels. You know, otherwise without that faith component, those jewels, they just stay there in the mountain. You know, there's no means for us to actually take them back and to absorb them into our lives. So that was um, something that I found um, personally quite inspiring. And we have some more of these little stone arhats from Korea. You know, these ones are 600 to 1,000 years old. And, you know, even 1,000 years ago, the, this image of an awakened being, it was something that would have been inspiring in people's lives. So people, you know, just ordinary people, farmers, you know, they would have, uh, you know, prayed to these arhats, even if they didn't have a sophisticated understanding of Buddhism, they could appreciate, you know, there's something sacred or something special in this ideal of a perfectly awakened being. So these ones, I should have mentioned, they're um, from a temple called uh, Changnyongsa Temple. And yeah, I think there were originally 500 of them in this collection, but maybe not all of them were remaining. So I don't know if anyone can guess um, which arahant the statue out the front is meant to represent, but I'm guessing it's meant to represent Venerable Mahakasapa, because as we know, Venerable Mahakasapa was the um, one of the Buddha's leading disciples. And he, you know, he's quite famous for living in the mountain. His home was the Vipali cave. 
So we can imagine, you know, that's uh, Venerable Mahakasava looking quite smug there in the mountain. So that's really where I wanted to start for this evening. Um, because what I'll be doing in terms of structuring the talk is to go from Mahakasapa's own um, story and the instructions that the Buddha gave to Mahakasapa and then to expand out the theme of joy from there. So Mahakasapa had originally gone forth and maybe some of you know the story where his wife was Bada Kapalani. That particular story um, is from a different location. Um, are we talking about some material that comes from the Samyutta Nikaya about Mahakasapa's going forth story, which doesn't actually mention Bada Kapalani. So he's gone forth, he's put on a yellow robe and he's traveling along the road between Rajagaha and Nalanda. So Nalanda is to the north of Rajagaha. And, you know, we can imagine that, um, you know, he's, he's walking and he's, he's looking um, for a teacher. He hasn't met the Buddha yet. He's embarked on this journey and, you know, maybe he doesn't know where it's going to take him. And, you know, he's walking along the road and he sees the Buddha sitting at the Bahiputta shrine. And, you know, Mahakasapa, he had, you know, this incredible faith in the Buddha. And, you know, his um, exclamation is that, you know, if there's any enlightened being, um, this is it. And he immediately goes to the Buddha and requests to become his disciple. So, um, you know, clearly um, a very um, important turning point and encounter in Venerable Mahakasapa's life. And after um, Mahakasapa has, you know, been accepted as the Buddha's disciple, um, you know, the Buddha then gives some instructions to Mahakasapa. He gives an awada, he gives some advice. And this actually forms Venerable Mahakasapa's ordination. So I wanted to share this advice that the Buddha has given to Venerable Mahakasapa. So this is from the Chivra Sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, in the Kasapa Wagga. So that's in the chapter on Venerable Mahakasapa. So reading from the Sutta, when I had said this, the Blessed One said to me, Kasapa, if one who does not know and see should say to a disciple so single-minded as yourself, I know, I see, his head would split. But knowing Kasapa, I say, I know. Seeing, I say, I see. Therefore, Kasapa, you should train yourself thus. I will arouse a keen sense of shame and fear of wrongdoing towards elders, the newly ordained, and those of middle status. Thus, you should train yourself. Therefore, Kasapa, you should train yourself thus. Whenever I listen to any Tamma connected with the wholesome, I will listen to it with eager ears, attending to it as a matter of vital concern, applying my whole mind to it. Thus, you should train yourself. Therefore, Kasapa, you should train yourself thus. I will never relinquish mindfulness directed to the body associated with joy. Thus, you should train yourself. And um, to me, that's actually, that's very interesting advice because we see there are three things that the Buddha has told um, Venerable Mahakasapa to do. So the first of those things being um, to have um, what we call Hiri Othapa, or this sense of, um, <laughs> of, uh, of conscience and the sense of knowing what's right and wrong um, in front of the elders, the newly ordained and the middle monks. So 
you know, he has to know how to behave himself in the community, um, which is obviously a very important aspect of, of joining a community because that's what Venerable Mahakasava has just asked to do. And the second thing that the Buddha's asked Venerable Mahakasava to do is whenever, um, you know, he listens to a Dhamma talk, you know, a, a talk that's about wholesome, about the wholesome or cultivating wholesome states, um, what he should do, he should listen to it with eager ears, attending to it as a matter of vital concern. So, you know, when he listens to the talk, um, you know, there's a degree of attention involved that um, he's actively, you know, maybe seeking out the main points and asking questions about them. And the third thing that the Buddha has asked um, Venerable Mahakasapa to do is, um, this is the one I want to talk about this evening, is to never relinquish mindfulness directed to the body associated with joy. So, you know, sometimes when we think about Venerable Mahakasapa, Venerable Mahakasapa um, was the king of the ascetic practices. He kept the 13 Jitangas and you know, for a very long time, he never lay down. He went from house to house receiving alms, and he was well known for having a very humble manner of dress and a very humble, you know, manner of living and eating, and also for living in these very remote locations, like in, you know, in the cave on the mountain. So we might think that this type of person, you know, maybe they might be uh, not so happy, <laughs> but actually what the Buddha is saying is that what Mah Mahakasapa should do is to always train in joy. And this instruction clearly had an impact on Venerable Mahakasapa because he, what he says after that is for seven days he ate the nation's alms food as a debtor. And what does that mean? You know, he has, he has debt because he's um, received the offerings of lay people and these lay people um, they expect to get merit because you know lay people have this understanding that you know maybe monks are like arahants so the fact that he hasn't fulfilled people's expectations yet you know that's what's um, referred to as um, ina in Pali which is debt but on the eighth day um, Mahakasapa fulfilled everyone's expectations and was enlightened and, you know, his enlightenment was um, so obvious that what he's saying about his own awakening is that you may as well try to hide an elephant behind a palm leaf <laughs> um, because there's just no point trying to hide the six insights that Mahakasapa has obtained. Those six insights being the Chalabinya. So um, the Chalabinya these like six higher knowledges, including psychic powers, the divine ear, uh, knowledge of the minds of others, knowledge of former um, abodes, former lives, the divine eye, and the destruction of the taints. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more this evening um, about this concept of what it means to train in joy. Because actually, as Buddhists, when we undertake the Noble Eightfold Path, um, we can also say that the Noble Eightfold Path in Pali is Piti Gamaniya. It's to be walked with joy. So actually, the whole practice of Buddhism can also be described as a training in joy. And um, joy is obviously something we feel with our bodies. And um, the Buddha's asked Mahakasapa, you know, to practice that bodily awareness, that bodily mindfulness that's accompanied by joy. So I wanted to expand that out a little bit in terms of what do we actually mean by joy in this particular context of meditation. So one, one scheme of talking about meditation that is found in, say, the Satipatthana Sutta and in other places in the canon is a scheme called the Vajangas. 
So bhajanga is made up of two words. The first of those words is bodhi, meaning awakening. And the second of those words is anga, meaning a limb. And, you know, what are these limbs of awakening? So we have the first one, which is sati, which is mindfulness. The second one, which is tamavichya, the investigation of principles or the investigation of tamas. The third one, which is virya, so energy. The next, which is piti, um, you know, here translated as rapture. The next, which is tranquility, pasati. Um, we also have meditative absorption, which Bhante Sujato has given as immersion, samadhi, and equanimity, which is upekka. So we come to meditation, and the Buddha said, you know, when we meditate, um, we all meditation has to come through this gate of mindfulness. And what he's actually said about that is that mindfulness is always helpful. So we take up a particular theme or topic of meditation and we bring um, a certain clarity of mind to that. And, you know, from there we discern between wholesome and un unwholesome states and that ability to know the difference between, yes, this is wholesome and, you know, no, this is not wholesome or, you know, yes, this is blameless. No, this is not blameless, you know, um, between um, a refined state and an unrefined state or between a bright state and a dark state. Actually, that discernment is called Dhammawichya. So we've come to whatever, you know, mind we brought into the meditation with mindfulness and of the possible mental states we have, we've been able to, um, to separate them out into ones that should be cultivated and ones that shouldn't be cultivated. So from there, we proceed with the cultivation of wholesome states. And as we develop wholesome states, our minds acquire energy because, you know, that unwholesomeness was really impressing our minds beforehand. So as we go through this process of cultivation, our minds clear up, they become calmer and brighter and become, you know, naturally quite energized. And this is where we start to have this, um, this factor of joy coming in. So we have this very interesting word here, which is piti. In Sanskrit, it's priti. And um, here it's rapture. So this piti is one of the two major Pali words for happiness or joy, the other one of them being sukha. So piti um, has this quality of being quite engaging or exciting to the mind. So, you know, sometimes you might get goosebumps or your hair might stand on end. So we have these, um, you know, these very, um, rapturous feelings and this is obviously something that meditators experience you know just the other day the meditators were telling me actually I, I had this experience and I felt like I was floating so you know these things are um, quite common in meditation actually and you know from that experience of pithy our minds gain an attraction to the object of meditation and they're not wondering so much. And that, um, you know, that also in turn leads to um, this concept of tranquility. So we have tranquility of mind and we have tranquility of body. And both of those things are referred to as pasadhi. So what gives us this ability to sit for a very long time in meditation? Actually, it's pasadhi. It's not, you know, it's not necessarily that we've made an aditan, but our body has become um, so uh, quiet that we don't feel any need to, to move. And one of the amazing things about Venerable Mahakasapa, this is, um, this is given in, in another sutta, in the Udana, you know, Venerable Mahakasapa is recorded 
as sitting for meditation, you know, for seven days straight without um, getting up, without um, drinking or eating. So what is it that, you know, that enables Venerable Mahakasapa to do this? Um, you know, that quality of the sadhi, that quality of tranquility of the body is, is very strong. And we have samadhi. So samadhi here being a kind of synonym for jhana. So any of the four jhanas. Um, and, you know, what's the pinnacle of the cultivation of jhana? Actually, it's upekka. So um, this very purified and neutral emotion. So um, this set of principles is very inspiring, um, or at least if you're a meditator and you understand, you know, what this means in terms of what your body and mind are going through. In your meditation, um, it can be inspiring. And that's why sometimes for the sick Buddhists, um, you know, not even necessarily Buddhist, you know, just anyone who requests it. Um, we can do a kind of like supported recitation or even supported meditation when they're sick by doing um, the recitation of these bhajangas as a type of chanting. So we have like the Mahakasapa Thera Bhajanga where the Buddha... Um, you know, or one of the leading disciples, I'm not quite sure which one it is, actually recites these bhajangas to Venerable Mahakasapa during his illness. And as a result of that, um, his, you know, he is able to um, have a bit more um, mental energy and strength. You know, his mind brightens up a bit and he recovers from his illness. And in Western medicine, there's something these days which is called the relaxation response, which um, has some parallels to the use of these bhajangas um, as a way of um, relieving the suffering of a sick person. Because um, obviously when our body relaxes, that in itself will do a lot to improve our circulation and um, you know, to help calm down the whole system, which, um, you know, it clearly supports healing and immunity. So what's actually um, being said here, um, I've taken this particular excerpt from the Anguttara Nikaya, is that when these seven awakening factors are developed and cultivated, they fulfill three knowledges. So actually these bhajangas, this cultivation of uh, piti through meditation, this cultivation of, um, uh, you know, these joyful emotional states, right through to this very refined emotional state of vipekka as the pinnacle, um, when these are cultivated, they fulfill the three knowledges. So they can take you right through to complete awakening. So the three knowledges being the recollection of past lives and um, the knowledge of um, beings being reborn according to their karma. And also um, they realize, I'm just reading from the text here, the undefiled freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom in this very life and live having realized it with their own insight due to the ending of the defilements. So very interesting. So we see in Venerable Mahakasapa's case, what would that mean? You know, Mahakasapa's um, training in joy, actually that instruction by the Buddha, it was an instruction that would have taken him through to the cultivation of the bhajangas and the cultivation of complete awakening. So I have a nice little picture here too. I have, I'll just get my picture up. I have, um, that's Ajahn Chah looking very happy there with his hands in the air. 
That particular picture was taken on one of Ajahn Chah's visits to the UK. And um, Ajahn Brahm actually has that picture on his personal shrine. Okay, so I've just, I've scrolled too far. So, you know, we've been talking about the Bajangas and some of the Bajangas are calming and some of them are energizing. So we can see on the top of the screen. So which of them are calming, which of them are energizing? So out of them, the awakening factors of tranquility, immersion and equanimity are calming. So we have um, Basadi being tranquility, Samadhi being immersion here, and Upekka being equanimity. So these are the, the calming set within that set of seven. And some of them are energizing. So within the set, Dhammavichya being investigation of principles, Virya being energy, and Piti being rapture are the energizing ones. So what that actually says here is that that quality of joy, um, you know, it brings brightness and energy to the mind because when we lack joy, you know, we, we lack energy. So like if we're feeling depressed or something, the whole world is kind of grey, like you can't see or taste or smell anything properly. Um, <laughs> you know, you just have no um, focus because, you know, your mind is very scattered. That when we have joy, actually, it becomes a lot easier for the mind to calm down because that quality of contentment means that the mind's not being, you know, dragged all over the place by whatever comes up. And I just, um, I have one final reading. So this will be the reading that I'm going to close on. And this is just a reading from the Mahanama Sutta. And I wanted to share this because there's a very beautiful Pali saying that we'll wrap up on today. So the Pali saying is, Sukhino chittang samadhyati, the happy mind enters samadhi. So if you want to know, actually, um, why isn't my meditation progressing? Actually, um, you know, the first question we should be asking ourselves is, am I happy? And I used to attend a temple, actually. I used to attend um, Gold Coast Temple. Um, very lovely uh, Dhammayut temple called Wat Sangharatanaram. And when I was a student, um, I would have been about 18 or something. I used to take um, dana there sometimes before I went to Perth um, to go stay at nunneries for the first time. And every time I went to that temple, one of the monks used to ask me, um, are you happy? And I, I thought it was a bit strange at the time, and I thought maybe actually, um, maybe the venerable just has limited English. But if we look at this question, are we happy? Actually, this is the most important question for whether we succeed or fail in meditation, because if we come to our meditation and, you know, if we aren't content, if we aren't grateful, um, <laughs> there's not really much of of a foundation for the mind to actually settle down because all of those qualities, you know, the contentment, the gratitude, those are what, um, what stop our mind from moving all over the place and make meditation possible. And what's being said here in this Mahanama Sutta is that um, when you're joyful, rapture springs up. When the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body becomes tranquil, you feel bliss. And when you're blissful, the mind becomes immersed in samadhi. Um, so it's there in the text. So until, um, you know, without that joy, um, our body just won't calm down. It's actually the, the joy, which is, you know, that joy that comes from letting go, which is what um, gives us the ability to sit for longer periods of time and to actually stable our minds, to actually stabilize our minds in meditation. 
So one more time, um, very nice take home message for today um, to close on. Um, if I repeat it, you'll remember it. So that Pali saying is Sukhi no chitang samadhi yati, the happy mind enters samadhi. I think that's a great point to close on. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to navigate back to the stream yard screen on Chrome. Okay, hitting escape. Aha. Uh -huh. And I'm back with all of you now. So I think um, my Tilak was going to open up to questions. Oops. Uh, let me read this the screen. Yes, uh, Aya, yes, thank you for the wonderful sharing on joy. Um, the thing was, uh, we couldn't see much of your screen. So what I did was while you were speaking, I had actually interjected by uh, showing the screen that I had on my PC. So the audience mm -hmm. could actually see it better. The, the point size was much bigger. So they could read it actually. Uh, uh, thanks so much for that. That's a huge help. Yeah, I think uh, you didn't realize what I was doing at the back end. But uh, I've also noticed that we don't have much questions receiving or rather no questions at all. Uh, maybe it's too early in the evening for our listeners to ask any questions or rather they are kind of still absorbing what you said. Um, but just for our audience sake, if you do have any questions, please do send it to us at our info at buddhismahavira.org and I will forward those questions to Aya Suvira. Um, maybe she can take it up with you personally on a, on, on a direct message to you. So if you do have any questions, please uh, look for us on our Facebook page and send us a direct message and we will reply to you accordingly. Uh, so with that, we've come to the end of this evening's Dhamma sharing. But before we, we end, I would like to invite Aya Suvira to conduct the Anamodana. Uh, sure, because, um, you know, no questions. It's either very good or very bad. It's, yeah. Maybe it's very good because everyone's yeah. understood everything, or it's very yeah, bad then, because no one's understood anything, yes. and therefore you have nothing to ask. So I'm just going to assume it went very well then. Yeah. <laughs> and then we everyone just, has understood just, everything just, 100%. Had, but, yeah, we've just had a couple of arahans uh, just popping up this evening, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, so everyone's understood everything 100% and therefore um, we don't have any questions, which is okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the um, merit dedication. So I'll do the um, chanting to share merits. Akasata chapumata deva naga mahidika punyantang anamuditwa chirang rakantu sasanang akasata chapumata deva naga mahidika punyantang anamuditwa chirang rakantu desanam akasata chapumata deva naga mahidika punyantang anamuditwa chirang rakantu mang paranti Idan vanya dinang ho tu sukita hantunyata yo. Idan vanya dinang ho tu sukita hantunyata yo. Idan vanya dinang ho tu sukita hantunyata yo. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. There's a phone call coming. In. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Aya Suvira, for the wonderful sharing this evening. Uh, so before we end, I would like to re remind our uh, viewers that Aya Suvira will be on again next Friday, also talking on the pure bliss and the theory of practice of joy of Buddhism, but this time from the perspective of Abhidhamma and the commentaries. So please do join us next Friday at 7 p.m. Please take note that the time difference is 7 p.m. It's not 8.30 as usual. Uh, so have your dinner early at and have join us at 7 p.m. on Friday. Uh, I think it's the 21st, if not mistaken. Let me check the calendar. Yes, Friday the 21st, um, here at the BMB's uh, Facebook page live. Uh, with that, we've come to the end of this evening's Dharma sharing. I would like to take this opportunity to wish uh, Bhante Suvira our warmest regards and our thanks for taking time off. It's almost, I think, 11 p.m. now in Sydney and sharing your Dhamma knowledge with us. Um, and we also would like to thank our sponsors, um, 
is there a bit just me a minute i think is there a question no there's no question there's a comment um so something just came in on the screen just now so i'm just wondering whether it was a question so we also like to thank our sponsors and also to all our listeners who stayed up with us this early this this uh, evening here on sunday in malaysia and also the rest of the world because we broadcast uh, throughout the uh, throughout the world actually and um, we look forward to seeing ayas suvira next friday so till then sukihotu and stay safe okay sukihotu stay safe too see you bye